Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the beneficiary meeting number two. Uh, we're just waiting for a few more people to hop on here. Uh, welcome. We appreciate you all coming tonight. Cedric, whenever you're ready, I'll um, I'll let you start us off. Sounds good. Why don't we just give everybody just one more minute before we go ahead and begin. Okay, it's just about 6.02, so out of courtesy for everybody's time, we're going to go ahead and get started. But before we dive into uh, tonight's beneficiary meeting number two for the Walapu'e Kuleana Homestead Project, um, we want to begin with Apule. Um, first, I'll ask if there's anyone from the community would, who would want to volunteer to uh, offer a pule for us this evening, and if not, someone from, from the department will do so. So I'm just going to pause to see if we have any volunteers. Okay, seeing and hearing none, I will going to ask my dear friend Andrew Choi if he would pull it for us this evening. Mahalo, Cedric. Um, Ipui Kako. Uh, Keakua, uh, thank you for opportunities to serve you and to show your love to others through our actions, our words, and our thoughts. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mahalo, that is Andrew Choi, the Pro, uh, planning Office Program Manager for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. I would also like to say hello to the uh, staff from G70 who are joining us, and you'll be hearing from them largely throughout tonight's presentation. And um, also aloha to Commissioner Zachary Helm, who is joining us on tonight's uh, call. Um, see, Barbara, are you running the slides on your side? Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, and tonight's meeting will be to provide a, an update and gather more information from the applicants on the agricultural waiting list for the island of Molokai with regard to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands proposed Walapu'e uh, Kuleana Homestead project. Um, we have quite a lot of slides, so I'm, kinda, I'm gonna kind of hurry through these first opening slides so that we can spend a lot of time on the meat of the presentation as well as have a uh, time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Um, we're gonna talk about the project background, explain to you where we are within the planning process, and then our consultants, engineering firm Group 70 or G70, you'll be hearing from their team tonight with regard to the existing environmental conditions, the findings that they've had um, as they've gotten into the field to gather information and conduct investigations. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about next steps. You know, what does the Juliana Homestead Settlement Plan look like, and how do we go through the process of drafting an environmental assessment? And then we'll have opportunity, as I mentioned a little while ago, for some Q&A and hopefully a really nice discussion. And I do wanna thank everyone for um, joining us here on an evening and bearing with us, you know, having these virtual meetings. Uh, we prefer to be there in person and we're hoping to do so, you know, as the restrictions lift up, we're hoping that we get to uh, see everyone in person for maybe a meeting three. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Barbara. Okay, for those of you who have participated in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, beneficiary consultation or beneficiary information meetings, this slide is going to look very familiar to you. Uh, we seek to have kuleana for everyone as part of the meeting. So a few things. We ask that everyone be respectful of the person who's talking and try not to interrupt each other. 
uh, please wait for the facilitator to call on you. Uh, that'll be me. Uh, we're going to utilize the chat box. For those of you who are using a computer, you can type your questions into the chat, bo chat box, either directly to me as the facilitator or to the group. Um, when addressing other participants, we just ask that you be respectful and show aloha and treat each other how you would like to be treated. And throughout this conversation and through many conversations um, with regard to Hawaiian homes, we're going to agree to disagree on different items. And we accept that others may have different perspectives. And that's okay, as long as we're not disagreeable to each other, because later on down the road, we may be able to agree on something else. And we ask that everyone tonight have an open mind, and we hope that you take home some new ideas and new information. And I'm going to do my very best. Um, you know, we've got quite a quite an audience, so I'm going to try to do my very best to give everyone an opportunity to speak and ask their questions and make sure that we take the time to address anything that is brought up here this evening. Uh, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, this one everybody should know. Um, if you don't know how to use the chat, that's okay. And if you don't know how to use the raise hand feature, that's okay too. We're going to get through this uh, meeting together. I'll call on everyone as we go along. No worry about that. And then at the bottom of this slide um, is the link. If you're here, you already visited this link because this is the landing page where the department is placing all the information related to this particular project. And this slide and information from tonight's meeting will be there at the conclusion of the meeting. Next slide, please. Um, we always wanna make sure that uh, we acknowledge the founder of this act. And we're in our hundredth year Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalani Anaole, uh, without his advocacy and for his group of friends at the time, a hundred years ago, to push this act forward, you know, we would not have the things that we have today. So we always want to acknowledge and give honor to Kuhio. Prince Kuhio Day is uh, going to be acknowledged formally as a state holiday this year on March 25th. Uh, the 26th is his birthday. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the planning process and I'm going to at this time I'm going to turn this slide over to Andrew Choi from our planning office to uh, explain to everyone what this graph means. Andrew. Um, mahalo again Cedric. Um, for those of you who have attended some of our planning meetings throughout the years on um, this diagram should look familiar to you. What it explains is how the department um, makes decisions in terms of policies and priorities. Um, we are guided by our planning system. Our planning system consists of three tiers. Um, at the top tier is our general plan, which consists of statewide policies and programs. It's currently going undergoing an update, so some of you may have participated in those meetings. Um, in the second tier, uh, we start to get a little bit more uh, specific in terms of geography. We have our island plans which articulate the Hawaiian Homes Commission's land use policy for lands on each island. So the commission uh, through the island plan designates lands for residential use, agriculture use, pastoral use, commercial use, or community use. So those policies are found in the island plans. Also on the second tier is our strategic program plans, which relate to statewide policies and specific subject matters, such as water, energy, and agriculture. Um, at the third tier, um, which is where we are tonight, um, we have our regional plans um, that relate to specific regions and also development plans, uh, which relate to specific areas that the department will be developing for homesteads. So yeah, that's where, where we will be. Um, guys, you might want to mute yourself, guys. Um, so, yeah, tonight we're here to talk about the Ua'opu'e uh, Kuliana Settlement Plan, which is on the third tier of the department's planning system. And I will pass it back to Cedric. Oh, sorry, Cedric, you're on mute. You would think that after two years of this, we'd be able to get that taken care of. I apologize. Um, to walk us through these next couple of slides, uh, many of you know Gigi Kyrell from our planning office. She's gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, the planning process, where we've been, where we're at right now, um, and sort of how this effort fits into the department's overall planning process. Gigi, are you there? Aloha, can you hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. Great, okay. Uh, aloha everyone, good evening. Uh, welcome again to um, our beneficiary meeting. 
on the Ualapu'e Kuleana Homestead Project. Uh, many of you who've been attending the last couple of meetings have seen this slide before. Uh, just a real brief background. Uh, the department's uh, Moka'i Island Plan was adopted in 2005. Uh, that is our document that we use uh, for land use uh, designations. Uh, and on the island of Molokai, we have areas designated for residential, general ag, special district, and community use. Uh, in 2005, the Walapu'e area was identified as a high priority uh, area for uh, residential development, uh, homesteading. And uh, up until this time, we have not been able to move forward with that. Uh, due to um, access to potable uh, drinking water, uh, as well as funding resources uh, to develop it as a residential area. So that has been on hold. Uh, in 2019, uh, the commission adopted the update to the regional plan. Uh, regional plans build a sense of community and capacity. Uh, they stimulate partnerships for development and improvements and they facilitate beneficiary participation in issues and areas of concern. And the regional plans identify priority projects within existing as well as planned homestead areas. Regional plans document current conditions and trends. Uh, they analyze state and county plans to identify a prioritized list of projects that are important to the community and to the department. This particular uh, project, Wallapu'e Homestead, uh, Kuleana Homestead Project, is a beneficiary-driven project. It was proposed by applicants, um, and it uh, it became one of the uh, top priorities in the regional plan. And the Ahunui Homestead Association um, was identified as the community champion. They stepped up to the plate to take this on and to uh, work with us. Uh, with the department uh, to help uh, do the planning phase of this project. Next slide. So this is uh, just a overview map of the area we are talking about in regards to, to the Ualapu'e Kuleana Homestead project. As mentioned earlier, uh, it is uh, the number one identified priority project in the Molokai Regional Plan that was adopted in 2019. Uh, this project went through extensive beneficiary consultation over 15 months. Um, and the idea was to move from a traditional uh, residential uh, development uh, to a Kuleana Homestead subsistence ag uh, project. Um, and again, this, this plan and project um, planning phase was approved by the commission uh, in February of 2020. Uh, next slide, which I think yeah. we're turning over to our consultant, for, uh, yeah. G70. Thank Mahalo. you, Judy. Mahalo nui. Um, aloha mai kako. Uh, for those who may be your first time here. My name is Kabiko McKaig. I'm a planning principal here at G70. And again, much uh, much aloha to everyone for being here this evening. And again, as Cedric and others have iterated, you know, hopefully our next meeting can be yalo uh, ahialo on, on the moku and we can have this conversation uh, together. But anyway, um, to move this along, because there is a lot of slides to cover, just wanted for those who may not be familiar, like, okay, what, what when you use these words, Kuleana Homestead Program, what do you actually mean? And so, Really briefly here, it's actually a portion of the administrative rules that help to govern the, the policies and guidance to, to Hawaiian homelands in full. And if you want to pull up the actual administrative rules, it's section 10.3-30. And I just want to highlight a couple of key things here. So in terms of a program, there's a couple of key things to point out. One, it's being it's it's a it's a designation, it's a designation that occurs for available unimproved homelands and that when we go through this process, it's suitable for use by lessees who wish for both immediate access to the land for subsistence purposes and who are willing to live on the land and accept an unapproved lot in an as-is condition. 
Um, so basically more, more geared towards um, just accepting the AINA and the condition that it's in. There are some rules and stipulations about what the department needs to provide, which I'll cover in the next slide. And the last two bullet points is, you know, um, over time, the lessee must participate in what would become a homestead association and that the lessee will also maintain rights of ways and lots. Next slide, please. And so the question is, well, what's the responsibilities of DHHL underneath the rules? So one is the Hawaiian Homes Commission ultimately determines which wait lists or lists to use to make kuleana awards, um, as we may have shared in previous meetings. Primarily here, we're looking towards subsistence agriculture. So it's primarily starting with the agricultural wait list. The department is also then required to then provide a meets and bounds description of the lot and an unpaid right away to the awarded lots. And per rule, these are the only re specific requirements. Now that being said, you know, one thing working with, with the department and other communities with similar planning is we try to you know, um, also identify what are the other needs and how do we collectively work together towards addressing those, those needs. Next slide, please. So again, um, just reiterating what I said earlier for immediate use and subsistence purposes, um, participating as an active member in the association and, and really to amplify here that over time, the association could, can, could come up with its own rules and agreements, but until such time, um, you know, applicable federal, state, county rules and policies would be in place. And as I mentioned that, you know, maintenance of the right of way to the homestead track and lots would be ultimately the responsibility of the lessees. Next slide. So you may ask yourself, well, why would I want on a homestead lot besides the reasons just stated. You know, one against a shorter, potentially shorter time on the wait list. And I think Gigi may be explaining that in, in the next slide here. Um, and it, it allows the department, you know, in terms of we, we apply a holistic approach to the, to the planning strategy and that actually allows us to identify, um, I'd say a larger number of, of leases that could be awarded underneath this, you know, in this case, subsistence ag. And it then it, it empowers, I believe, or allows the ability for the homesteaders that would receive these lots to start in the capacity that works for them and, and work to expand over time. Again, with sub ag here, we're looking to help generate the agricultural based activity uh, first and foremost and, and working together as a collective to, to make that work. And that's really the last bullet to emphasize that is really truly trying to build a community um, of Ohana that wanna work together, have capacity to work together, sharing resources, sharing knowledge, and working towards the common goal of, of um, calling the place home. So that's um, that's the presentation here. I'll turn it back to Gigi now as she'll explain a little bit about the Kuleana lease versus conventional lease. Mahalo. Aloha everyone. Um, so as uh, we mentioned before, uh, this particular project is for a Kuleana homestead lease. It is a very different uh, uh, non-traditional type of lease um, versus the department's conventional homestead lease. The Kuleana program, uh, all, what it offers is a faster track for beneficiaries to get on the land. Uh, there is minimal improvements. Uh, so uh, unlike the traditional lease where there would be uh, roads and potable water, um, sewer uh, and, and other types of improvements, uh, this, this Kuleana homestead lease would not have that. Uh, the only uh, requirement would be an access, uh, access road to the homestead area and to the lots. Um, much of the responsibility is actually on the lessee and it also promotes a sense of uh, community uh, stewardship uh, where as a community, uh, the lessees work together uh, to take care of the land. Um, in a conventional lease uh, that some of you may be familiar with, the department is responsible uh, for the entire development uh, where we would have to uh, dedicate and invest the resources, including funding to develop the uh, water infrastructure, uh, sewer, power, roads, etc. So it is a prolonged development timeline. Um, and again, more responsibility is on the department. Um, so that's really the trade-off. It's really the time frame 
So for the Kuleana lease, um, you know, lessees, the responsibilities on the lessees more so than the department. So it, it is more of a fast track uh, for the lessees to get on the land. Uh, for this slide, we just we wanted to show the overall sequence of um, phases that will go into the Kuleana Homestead uh, project. Uh, we are in the planning phase, and there is a lot for us to do here. Um, the main outcomes after we complete the planning phase, uh, the main outcomes are to come up with a final Kuleana Homestead Settlement Plan uh, that will go before the commission to be approved, as well as the required environmental assessment. Uh, that also will be finalized and submitted to the commission for approval. So this is the phase we're in now. Um, after the planning phase is, is totally complete, uh, which is it's gonna take us a few more months. We're still working on all the pieces. Uh, then it'll move into the development phase. Uh, basically the department uh, carves out the meets and bounds of each lot and um, puts in the uh, road access to the homestead. Uh, so that's gonna require raising funds. Um, and then of course the uh, construction of those particular pieces. Uh, then it'll go into the next phase, which is the lot offering, awards, and lease signing. And then, of course, the final phase we are all wanting to get to is actual settlement onto the uh, lots uh, and the use, the active use of the lots as subsistence farming. So those are the major pieces. Next slide. I think we turn it over to G70. Yes, mahalo Gigi, I appreciate it. Aloha everyone, my name is Barbara Natal. I'm a senior planner at G70 and I'm the project manager for the Ualapue Kuleana Homestead project. And I'm really excited to be here tonight. I just wanna go ahead and um, further do a deep dive on the uh, planning timeline. So we are in that first um, block that Gigi spoke about. And let me break that down to you just a little bit more. Um, we did start uh, this last year. Uh, we had um, our technical consultants go out. Um, in October, we did our first beneficiary meeting. Uh, uh, G70 did a site visit as well as a community meeting uh, in December. And here we are tonight at a second beneficiary meeting. And tonight we're really excited to um, learn more information from you. We're going to be asking you questions throughout the night. And it's really important that we get this feedback from you because this is what goes into the settlement plan, which is your settlement plan ultimately. Uh, then um, we'll take that information that you give to us. And then at the third beneficiary meeting, which we're looking at in April, um, we'll present uh, at least two lot schemes and they will show you what we've come up with from the answers again tonight. And then um, at the same time, we'll also have a draft Kuleana Homestead settlement plan ready for your review. Uh, and then we'll have a 30 day public period uh, review period for that. Um, then we'll go ahead and take that information. We'll revise the Homestead uh, settlement plan and, and in May or so, uh, we'll go come back to you, you folks, uh, fourth beneficiary meeting to uh, let you know what we've what we've heard and the final settlement plan that we're looking at. It's a it'll be a pre-final draft, and then also uh, give this to the community at the second community meeting. With that information, again, that we hear back from you, uh, yes, you don't like it, no, you don't, but we would like these things instead. Again, we'll put that all together and we'll complete the um, preliminary homestead settlement plan in June, and then we go ahead and present that to the Hawaiian Homes Commission in July. Uh, as an informational presentation. Then there's a gap there. We're going to, once we have a settlement plan, now we have something that we can uh, assess. We can go ahead and look at what kind of Im impacts will uh, uh, this settlement plan have uh, on, on the area. And uh, so we expect to have a draft of the environmental assessment in December. And we'll be uh, bringing that to your attention at a beneficiary consultation meeting then. We'll give you um, the final settlement plan and then the draft environmental assessment. Again, that goes through another 30-day comment period. We'll receive your comments, we'll integrate them and um, 
put that into the final settlement environmental assessment. And then uh, we are looking to get uh, Hawaiian Home Commission approval for both the settlement plan and the final environmental assessment in February 2023. So it does seem like it's a lot of time, but we are um, uh, working as fast as we can with the technical consultants and we want to make sure that we have, uh, we're looking at all the correct information to um, good, create a good plan for you. So again, the expected outcomes for the planning uh, phase are the Kuleana Homestead Settlement Plan, the environmental assessment, and then um, since there is a change from the conventional residential to the uh, subsistence agriculture, there most likely will be some uh, land use changes that will be need to be amended. Okay, all right, so this is um, our first uh, opportunity for us to receive some feedback from you. So we have decided to use this platform called Mentimeter. And what it does is it re does require you to use another device if you happen to have a cell phone. If you are on your computer and you have a cell phone, um, go ahead and um, go to your internet browser and type in www.menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com. And then it will ask you for a code and you would go ahead and enter the code 81605081. Um, if you don't have a phone, uh, you can also do a, um, a separate tab on your computer and you should still be able to type in the menti.com and add in your code and you should still be able to hear us and you can toggle back and forth between the tabs on your computer. Um, if you are on your phone, you can do the same. You can um, do a, look for a different screen. And um, again, you should still be able to hear us. Um, Finally, uh, we do realize that some of you may have multiple people that are uh, in one location watching this, and the Mentimeter does only accept uh, one answer at a time. So we are providing a link to the Mentimeter on the uh, website that was uh, flashed before. It's the DHHL um, Oalapue website, and we'll also give that to you at the very end, but there will be a link on there, and you can... Um, after the session, go ahead and uh, fill out the survey from there. I would also encourage you to let anyone that you know that is not on this uh, call tonight to go ahead and um, click on that link and fill out that survey because again, we're, we want to receive as much information as we can from all of the beneficiaries. Um, and finally, if you are having difficulty with the Mentimeter, uh, I've asked um, PE, my coworker, he will go ahead and put in the chat box uh, the questions that will be flashed up on the screen from the Mentimeter. Um, if you want your answer to be anonymous, uh, you can either uh, in the chat box where it says everyone, there's an arrow and you can click on it and you could either send it to Cedric or you could send it to PE so that your answer goes just specifically to them. But if you're not really worried about it, then you can just send it to everyone. Um, so let's get started. I hope that you've been able to log on to menti.com uh, and go ahead and enter the code 81605081. And if you're on there, oh, good. All right, so we set, I have some people that are already on. So everyone can see there's, um, do you have a Polina or a connection to this Aina? And do you either, I, yes, you do, or uh, Ole, no. And um, we'll give you an opportunity um, in the next slide if you, have not, if you don't have a Polina to this area. Great, and I'll give just a few, few more uh, seconds to make sure that everyone has a chance to answer this question. Barbara. Yes. I don't, I don't know how to get another tab. Okay. Uh, um, so what do I do? Do you know? It's weird. I normally able to do it, but for some reason I can't get a tab. Sometimes you have to uh, reduce your screen. So uh, of an up in the upper right hand side of the screen, you'll have an X and then you'll have two little boxes and then you'll have a line. Um, and if you click on the two little boxes that should bring it down and you'll see the tabs at the top. Is that helping? You're on mute. Okay, I see, I see you're nodding your head. Okay, all right, great. So um, again, go ahead and type in um, menti, www.menti.com. And then the code is 
great, this is exciting. It's really helpful for us to be able to get this feedback and uh, understand where you're coming from. And then, you know, it, we can also see what everyone else is thinking too. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on since we do have a lot of slides. Oh, maybe I should wait for just a little bit longer. I will go ahead and give one minute for each answer. Yeah, thanks, Barb, for facilitating, facilitating this. And I'll just simply add, you know, we, we've, so one, we've used this um, survey gauge, but really even the questions, right? We started off like a sense of Pilina to place, whether it's a, a genealogical association, whether maybe it's a place you, you know, you know of from your childhood, or it's a place that you've done everything from subsistence access, or just recognize the, 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 the mountains and or the oceans and and in that you have a sense of connection you know a lot of this kanaka um is super important right to just understand what is Pilina. and then if you don't have one i mean i mean the other part to that is if this is a place that's going to become home then it's an opportunity to learn to to create um connection by means of understanding everything from place names to mo'olelo to ka'a which we'll talk about a little bit a little bit later so we're asking with these questions with purpose to sort of set a context of both the, the potential community that will be here, as well as, again, that community's intentions and desires and hopes and dreams here. So I think this is like the fun part of what we do as planners is to really pulse a sense of community intent and 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 um, sort of this is the opportunity to dream. So anyway, I'll stop there and thanks, Barb, for facilitating. Sure, sure, of course. Okay, and I'm going to uh, go ahead then and move on to the next question. And that actually ties into what Kavika just talked about. Uh, it, you know, if you did say no, if you, uh, Ole, if you don't have a connection to this place, what do you hope to see or learn tonight that will help you create that Pilina? Or if you do already have that connection, what else would you like to learn? Um, what would be helpful? Um, do you wanna learn more about the history? Would you like to know about the cultural resources of you know, uh, some of the physical um, maybe uh, issues or not, your concerns that are happening in the area. Is there anything else that we can provide to you tonight that would help to create that connection? And you should be able to type into this. How do I get involved with the Kuleana Association? Uh, you know what would be great is if you could go ahead and you can uh, send a chat to me and send me your email and I'll make sure that that gets to the association and you can join. Uh, and there's actually two things. So there's Aho Nui um, uh, Association, uh, which is currently uh, a great group that is giving information on how to prepare for this homestead association. And then there will be another one that will occur after all the beneficiaries um, have been awarded the lands, and then um, it will create a, another homestead association. I hope that makes it clear. But uh, please, again, uh, if you're interested in joining the group now, uh, send me your email and we'll get that information to you. Uh, timeline to award through Kuleana process versus traditional. Okay. Understand how future homesteaders can become stewards of the land and resources. How we can fix that mountain, reforest that mountain with Hawaiian plants and fruit trees. How does the significant side effects the lots or would the study be shared? Yes. Uh, just to answer your questions uh, off the cuff real quick. Um, once we have the settlement plan together and we understand what we're going to do, then we're going to put together an environmental assessment and that will help us to understand um, what kind of effects this uh, settlement will have on the area and what can be done to help reduce any effects or how will it actually enhance the area. And that will be a part of the 30 day environmental um, assessment comment period. To be able to get on the land and farm and leave to our future generations, understanding the award process for this lands, and what size will the lots be? So, and that's something that we're gonna be asking you tonight. So it'll be up to you. Uh, uh, again, it's, we don't know, we wanna find out from you, what do you like? So stick around, that's one of the questions towards the end. Okay, I see that eight people have answered.
protecting the ex existing Pelina that exists among Manai residents by ending the potential for this DHL. And it's not moving. Ah, OK. Sure. Development to occur in Ualapue. OK. And I would say, you know, we, you know, again, we're just the consultants working on behalf of the department. Um, and as Cedric um, had said in the beginning, and Andrew had said in Pule, you know, um, not everyone may necessarily agree with this particular project, but that's the purpose why we have these conversations. So, so even if it's something that's seen here, right, um, as a contrast, if you will, it's still very important to hear um, those, these voices and perspectives as well. And maybe through conversation, there, there could be potential for some amenable solutions, um, maybe not. And we just have to respect those positions as we go through the process together. And we have, we'll have additional opportunities for you. I mean, anytime, please give uh, DHHL a call or an email, and we'll have that information at the end um, if you want to talk to them directly about the project. And then we'll also, we're hoping to have um, some additional time at the end of this project to uh, speak freely. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and to the next question. Uh, what is your favorite Halia Aloha or memory of Ualapue? And this is going to come up as a word cloud. So if you can try to do it in three words or less, one word. Um, for me, when we did a site visit, uh, PE did an amazing uh, chant and Oli when we got there and um, the winds came up and it just was a very spiritual moment for me. Um, so for me, that I would say the winds are one of my favorite Hali Aloha of this place. And we and we know we we also sensitive to the fact when we say Hali Aloha, you know, those are very intimate thoughts. So we're not asking this haphazardly either. And we do also respect, you know, if it's too personal, then you know, Ali Pilikia. Um, it's just too, I think, for those that feel one, they have they have a they have a something to share and they would like to share. I think understanding this Aina, it's, it's, I'd say ancestral manifestations um, become important for us to just recognize through the eyes, ears, experiences of those that, that know this place well. So, so Michael, we're starting to see some words come through here. And I think this is the kind where if, if people use the same word that word, it's bigger, if I'm not mistaken. And so I'm liking the fact we're seeing things like Momona, right? The abundance, the fatness of the land, the richness of the land. And Aina itself, um, roots, ancestors, respect, endemic plants, love of the land, lush beauty, beautiful words, beautiful sentiments. And this becomes important. This, this is not just something that you know, becomes um, convenient to put into the, the plan and we move on. Like, as we sit, as we as the planners, and uh, here tonight too, I think I have um, our engineers, we, we, we sit with these thoughts as part of our process to say, okay, how do we achieve a sense of Ohana? How do we respect Ohana are buried there? How do we look at opportunities to bring back the endemic plants? What do, what do we feel is the best way to um, address Kuleana to Aina and create a peaceful environment? So. These, these are words that will literally inform us. Oh, and mahalo to Mahina. I see your, your chat um, note it's supposed to be, okay. of course, when I'm reading it, it disappears off my chat, Um To be development free, I know. Mopopo. And I would leave it to the people that are more tech savvy than me on that. You know, we can probably adjust that in uh, after this meeting as Paul. Okay, I guess maybe a, um, another thirty seconds here, Barb. Maybe we can move on. Yes. I'm being the pushy guy tonight because we have lots to we cover. Do. Oh. It, it looks like typically ten people are answering, so um, I think okay. I will move on. And again, if you have uh, any other information you'd like to tell us, please let us know. And we'll also have a slide at the very end for additional comments. Oops, okay. I'm sorry. I wanted to do one more um, of these before we move back onto the 
presentation. And um, that is, did you participate in any of the following plans for the Ualapui community? Uh, did you participate in the Molokai Island plan for 2005 or the Molokai regional plan of 2018, 2019? The more recent one. So this is just important for us um, to just pulse people's um, um, familiarity with you know a process where the island plan that goes back well a ways. And I think I may share with others, like the Molokai Island Plan for me, I started here in 2001 at G70 and that was one of my first, I helped a little bit on the Koi Island Plan at the time, but Molokai Island Plan was my first project from beginning to end working with um, with, with all of you, you know, representing the beneficiaries, the communities, and it was probably one of the most uh, meaningful experiences of my time, just, just to understand the breadth of abundance and beauty from, from Kalamaula to Holehua, um, all the way to Kapa'akea, Kamilo Loa, and in, even here at Walapu'e. So um, good to see that there is some familiarity um, with this group, so mahalo. Okay, it looks like uh, just about everyone has had a chance to answer here, and I will go on, and um, this question will stay on until we move on to the next question. So I'm going to go ahead and just switch back over to the presentation. And um, again, just we want to bring you back to the planning process. What is it that we're doing when we are looking at this settlement plan? We look at a variety of factors in order to make sure that it's the um, best plan that it can be. Um, of course, we're looking at natural and cultural resources, cultural beliefs and practices in the area, um, hunting and gathering rights. Um, of course, the physical aspects of the land, the erosion and slope, um, accessibility. How can we actually get to this property? Um, what about water availability and protecting the wellhead? We're uh, um, looking for com community engagement. We are asking you questions. We're still uh, reaching out to various people and we would like to continue to receive your feedback as we go through this process. Um, uh, other infrastructure options and of course, proximity to emergency response. Um, in the planning that we've done so far, uh, I'll just give you kind of the, what we've done from the desktop. And then Kavika will tell us a little bit more about the uh, consultants that have done additional research for us. So uh, just looking at literature review, we've looked at a variety of different um, previous studies uh, with relationship to uh, this, the Manai area. And of course, we want to take this area in context with the whole Manai uh, community. We realize this is a unique community. Uh, it's one of the most intact and cultural sub subsistence landscapes. Uh, within Hawaii, and the entire Moku is vital to the subsistence lifestyle of its community and island residents. Um, however, there has been a significant decline in the health and abundance of ahupua'a resources, and we um, are keeping those in our mind as we continue with the planning process. And uh, looking at Oalapue itself, uh, we are of the ahupua'a planning the mind, um, what is uh, happens Malka affects Makai, as well as what happens Makai affects Malka, and we uh, understand that the the relationship, the inter interrelationships of these areas. And while DHHL does not own the whole uh, Ahupua'a, uh, we still want to take these factors into consideration. We want to make sure that what's happening on the land is not um, deteriorating the fish pond per se. Uh, so you all may know Oalapue is uh, essentially Oala the sweet potato and um, Pue a mound. An agriculture ahupua'a, it's located between um, Kahananui and the Kalua'aha ahupua'a. And um, uh, Mauka is um, Pu'ukilao, Makalihua, and Maile Lii. <laughs> And then um, also there's the Pukui watersheds and forests, and we realize there's uh, hunting and those um, activities that occur. And then um, Makai, there's uh, multiple springs, the fish ponds, of course, uh, Lo'i, and uh, all the abundant coastal resources in the reef there. Uh, we did have a question early on about land commission awards. So this is a map from uh, 1839, and um, this shows the uh, land commission awards that were um, located uh, around the fish pond here. And then this line here is the uh, 
DHHL property. So uh, from this and other maps, this area up here was uh, noted as crown lands, but we did have a question about these two lots over here, this one and two. Um, so we did some further investigation. Um, this particular map is a plat map and it was originally um, made in 1934. Uh, and so here we're going to look a little bit closer. This is the um, uh, tank access road. Here's the one and two properties that we're, we're concerned about. And if we zoom in just a little bit further, you can see that this is Hawaiian homelands and then this is the state of Hawaii. So uh, all of the property that is within DHHL uh, was either crown lands or state lands and uh, are not um, taking over any uh, private uh, land commission awards. Okay, again, uh, our desktop analysis, the rainfall of the area, it's, uh, it's low rainfall. Uh, 35 to 80 inches of rainfall per year. Um, most of the rainfall, of course, in, happens in the winter time. Uh, very coastal, uh, very dry, and then up, uh, Malka is moderately dry to mesic. Um, when we look at the tsunami and sea level rise of this area, the mapping you can see in the lower portion of the DHHL lands, it is within the uh, tsunami. Um, evacuation zone and the extreme tsunami evacuation zone. So that's more of the flat um, lower area. And then uh, we are outside of the sea level rise exposure area uh, as far as uh, 2100. Good news. Uh, soils are primarily uh, silty clay. And so as everyone under can see, it's there's severe runoff and erosion that can happen because it's made up of the silty clay. Uh, however, it's really good for um, use as pasture, truck crops, orchards, wildlife habitat, uh, habitat and home sites. Uh, and then again, topography. So the DHHL land itself, um, it ranges between 30 feet and 500 feet in elevation. Um, it can become very steep in some areas, uh, uh, up to a 20% slope. Um, and then of course, there's three large gulches. There's the Mo'omoku Ki uh, Ki'inohu ki and Kahananui. So we can't build in the gulches. We can only um, build in the flatlands above. The landscape's obviously been altered um, through ungulates and invasive plants. And then um, we recognize the high runoff and erosion, of course. And these are all the things that we're taking into consideration again when we're looking at where to put the, um, the lots. Uh, another one, uh, access, how will we get to the lots? Uh, water tank access road is one obvious location uh, on the land right now are hunting trails and we're looking at alternative routes. We would prefer to have two access points to the area in case of emergencies. Um, when we develop roads, we need to look at the slope and grade, um, understand how the water movements uh, and how it can be affected by erosion. And we wanna manage that uh, so that the roads stay in place and the water is properly um, drained. Um, all right, thanks for sticking in here with me. We've got a few more <laughs> slides going. So uh, again, of course, natural and cultural resources, uh, um, abundant heiau in the area. Um, we want to be able to identify them, uh, locate them and um, protect them. Uh, and we realize there's a composite heiau uh, where there's um, multiple heiau on the land and then also within the fish pond. So it creates a, a kino. Um, the fish ponds, of course, there's the Malka to Makai connectivity. We want to be aware of that. And the uh, cemetery, uh, there's a few cemeteries, but the one uh, that is on uh, adjacent to DHHL lands, there's the considerations from past lands, past plans to uh, create additional lands so that they can increase the size of that cemetery. Okay, and I'm going to hand this over to Kavika and he will let you know uh, what our technical consultants have been doing. Mahalo, Barb, and thank you for, for taking us through that. So, you know, when she says desktop analysis, right, one, and, you know, this time of COVID, I mean, to go on the AINA, we wanted to start with this accessing all available, you know, information that's you know, through state, county agencies, federal sources, past studies, and try to build a composite of understanding. And, and to complement that, um, we were able to, you know, to do a, a few assignments, and we still have a couple left to do. So the ones we were able to complete is an aerial survey, biological assessment and initial wildfire assessment and what um, we shared with others uh, that may have been previous means this whole process and I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time to kind of um, emphasize what that was. 
So Barb, you can take us to the next slide. So the aerial survey, we actually contracted with Resource Mapping Hawaii, which has helped us uh, immensely on many of these projects. You know, so you just think about just the large acreage of terrain. There's unfortunately no way, uh, why well, I don't say no way, but it would be very difficult to try and traverse all of this, in, you know, with, with a project team. So um, in this particular case, it was a helicopter flyover and we were able to basically gather uh, high resolution high resolution imaging for terrain. It uh, allows us to look at things like erosion patterns, vegetative cover. Um, in other cases, we've been able to identify historic properties, anomalies that help us to say, oh, what's that over there? And actually then send a team out to, to try and pinpoint more detail. So all I want to show here in the next two slides is the fact that this aerial imaging, please advance the slides, Barb. Um, the next slide really kind of shows, um, just showing the detail that we can get, and you can go to the next slide to take us to the focus. So, so really, again, this is a JPEG on a PowerPoint being broadcast versus Zoom. So even this quality is not necessarily the best, but but I, I can assure you that you know we can actually even zoom in with greater detail to see the scours in the roadway. We can see where vegetation changes, or even. Um, I'm not an expert, but people can actually identify the, the particular species type by the, the treetop or the patterns of the leaf, the color of the leaf. So this gives us a first chance to sort of identify what's in the landscape. Next slide. Uh, the second piece of the puzzle, we started to work on a biological assessment. Uh, the company called ACOS was the consultant. And again, for sake of time this evening, just a really high level. Um, they were able to survey most of the project area and, and the quick summary is that they identified about 56 specific plant species, about 75% are considered to be what they call introduced and 25% were deemed to be, to be native. Um, much of the lowland is, is what they qualify as um, koa haole dominated, dominated, excuse me, scrub forest, and also kiabi dominated forest in Savannah with riparian forests. Um, the upper portions, there's portions with with grass meadows and paper bark forests. And then there's some gulches there, which still, you know, that um, given the nature of uh, intermittent stream flow, the riparian forest there. And then so we just want to sort of qualify the zones to understand, well, are there like very well intact um, endemic forests that need to be protected? Um, I think what's, what's probably an opportunity here is that with the 25% native, and I know AHA has done some work on this too, is, you know, what can be done to, you know, maybe create a seed bank, create um, a, green, a greenhouse to then propagate plants. So as, as this project were to come online, especially as an agricultural based project, that um, step by step, we could actually reintroduce uh, native plants that actually have the, I call ancestral DNA, the genetic type to survive in this landscape because they do it by themselves without any human intervention. So you know, that could be one strategy as well as, as well as well as others in terms of introducing appropriate native plants to the area. Next slide. And so again, this is just a quick list of, of um, the species types, um, which is here for your reference. Again, happy to dive into any in specific questions. Even though I'm not the biologist, we have the report. Um, and again, as, at a certain point in time, all of this information will be made available uh, for you folks to access, read, review, comment on. Tonight is just a quick summary. And so same going on to then the, um, the avian or bird species and then uh, mammals. This is what was observed, right? So we have 17, what they call naturalized bird species. So, so no native birds per se, but um, I'm aware that Uwa'u and A'o, um, this is habitat for, for these native birds, uh, seabirds, but at least during this observation period, they were not seen. But again, we're not gonna say, oh, we didn't see them, so they don't exist. No. Um, well, we'll be sure to mention habitat for these two species. Similarly, you know, we've got mongoose, cat, dog, access deer, uh, cattle, and pig. Well, we also are aware, um, based upon some of the data, that ope -a -pe -a, um, this is habitat in which they can abide in or through. So um, th these were the species that were identified during the study. And then, you know, as part of the access deer management, you know, there is an existing, uh, within the regional plan, there's a, a desire to actually have um, a fencing plan as a means to control the feral ungulates and trying to work with not just the beneficiaries here that would you know, make this their home, but also ensuring other folks like um, hunters that would utilize this area for subsistence hunting practices. So there's specific recommendations of targeting smaller agricultural native reforestation areas for fencing to protect those habitat species and then slowly but surely maybe, um, you know, encourage the movement of ungulates to a 
to an area where then the, the native habitat is not being disturbed or damaged and trying to find a balance. So again, we don't have answers tonight as to how that will work, but we're trying to seek that balance. Um, similarly, we had ACOS go in and do a water and streams condition study. And this is one, it's, it's kind of twofold here, the, the purpose. One is to understand how does the water move when it does move and, and trying to define the gulches by, by, by the descriptions of are they flowing all the time, are they flowing part-time and where are they flowing to and from? And so what you see here, for example, is Kahananui Gulch of the three gulches with Mo'omoku and Ki'unohupi and the other two. Um, it was our assessment that this, this, um, this particular gulch, Kahananui specifically, may be categorized by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as jurisdictional waters. Um, that simply means, and, and again, it's a much deeper dive, but for tonight, it just means that you know, anything that would be pertinent to the care and protection of that particular stream has to take, in consideration, take into consideration working with the Corps of Engineers as these waters do have the potential or the capacity to flow down to the near shore areas. So anything that we're doing here in terms of either both the, you know, addressing existing erosion and runoff and or trying to create um, appropriate ecosystem restoration project would require then some coordination with the Corps of Engineers through, through that process. Next slide. And so again, um, very high level, the management recommendations coming out of the study, uh, there is a series of specific best management practices for erosion control, for dealing, uh, or not dealing, I should say, appropriately managing, working with the resources, uh, with seabirds, ope -a -ope -a, how to maybe a best approach um, a selective removal, exotic trees or invasives, and how would we then propagate native and or culturally relevant species uh, back into the, into the landscape. All this has to be coupled with the fact that, you know, any utilization of new roads and or addressing the existing roads because they themselves can, can become funnel, funnel um, become funnelers, is that even a word? They funnel the water that comes off of the runoff. And so, uh, again, kind of pull hole if we're trying to introduce something and everyone um, address the existing conditions that, that lie therein. And uh, lastly, to avoid locating homes in, in what we define as, as flood zones. For wildfire, um, you know, we worked with the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization who's based in, in uh, Hawaii Island, but their impact, their data, their kuleana extends across the Pai Aina, and it's really a blessing to learn from them. Um, you know, we're just sharing a very high level data. Basically, you know, what, what it comes down to is when we start to look at, you know, putting human beings in an area um, that is subject to wildfire conditions, right? Because it either has, um, either characteristics of um, having a lot of invasive grass that become, become fuel for fires, um, wind patterns, uh, how, how wind and fire can move up and through gulches and actually the gulches themselves can actually create a funneling, funneling effect for wildfire itself, that we need to be really cognizant of that. And so for this plan, as well as other plans we've worked on, it's just being cognizant of things of like fire breaks, um, how do we ensure clearing of roads and access ways for emergency and fire protection access? How do we purposely create fire breaks and buffers? Um, in other places, we've looked at the use of things like uh, Placidia or, or even uh, banana as, as plants that hold a lot of water. Um, and they can be like sort of a first line of defense. So you can plant those say, on the outskirts coupled in with a fire break or clearing coupled with the road you're kind of hoping that that would mitigate a great portion of any wildfire that would come from any, any particular direction. Again, this, this, is, this is just our beginning of our understanding to this place and we'll be working with the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization uh, to refine our plan as we move forward. And then um, at least for the last presentation for tonight, and I'll talk a little bit about the archeology span as well. So the Honuyakea process was something we, um, Group 70 was not familiar with, but we were introduced to Kialoa Mossman, and I, I personally knew his, or know his mama, Hui Hui Mossman, and they come from the Kanaka Ole uh, tradition on Hawaii Island. But um, they have been working, and so Kialoa is a fellow planner. And, you know, I've often talked about uh, for many years that the fact that, you know, and, and many others as well, that a lot of our Ike Kupuna, our ancestral knowledge is, is coded into our mele, into our Oli, into our Mo'olelo, and even to our, our Ka'au. And what it, you know, it would always be a good thing, you know, we always start with this baseline of all this other information, like what, what does our ancestral knowledge tell us and teach us about, about place? So the term Honuya Kea um, actually comes from a Ka'au of Hi'akakapoleo Pele, and actually I believe um, it was the name of the Va'a that 
brought uh, Pele and her, her ohana over to Hawaii. And it's a metaphor really from the Kanakaole Foundation's perspective. This is their process. This is you know, their, their, um, their gift, if you will, that it, it tries to create a sense of collaboration that literally carries um, people that hold various perspectives and talents within a community that hold specific bodies of knowledge that have been passed down ancestrally from generation to generation. And really the attempt here is to seek a working harmony with the natural and cultural environment. And so, so the intention here, we so this process was, was introduced back in November. I believe um, we worked with various groups to identify the individuals. And I, and I think we sent it out to 40 individuals. I think 10 had responded um, to, to participate over this two day period. And so when we talk about the formalization of couple and kanawai, these are specific terms related to, to uh, EKF. And uh, if you can take us to the next slide there, Barb, that kapu for them are, what are those resources that are crucial for the stability and survival of, of the ecosystem and the, and the natural communities within that ecosystem? And then the kanawai are, what are those actions needed to be taken by, by us, the human beings, to maintain uh, the quality and care and abundance of these resources uh, into perpetuity. So when we did this process, um, we looked at um, or went through went through a sequence of steps and and Barry, you can bring up both the kapu and the kanawai um, at one time. So the first kapu is uaka ua kahikawai. Yeah, water needs to flow to all inhabitants of the hupa, maka forest holding the water then flows to inhabitants. Maybe it seems, you know, like um, very common sense, but again, this is also coming from the traditions of the kupuna and looking at the kanawai through the, the mo'olelo of uh, kulokai, that you have this idea of the abundance. And again, for most of us as practitioners, this seems very inherent to our being, that, you know, growth up enough in the mountains has an effect, hopefully positive, uh, to what happens at the kai. But there needs to be this cognizance and always constant reminder that the two work in, in synergy together. And, and the other kind of way out of this comes from the idea of uh, hina uru o hi'a, that the moon controls the growth of the wellness and abundance of our forest as it really controls the movement of water uh, through the ohia, which many of us understand through this mo'olelo is one, one of the, the kinola of the forest um, of, of hi'aka herself, but also the, uh, it's, um, what's the holiday term we use? It's a key performance indicator. It's a KPI to define the abundance of the forest because without the canopy of the ohia, cannot have the low lying shrubs and you cannot have the mosses and the grasses underneath. So it's one living ecosystem that, that really is about water management and movement. If we move on to the second kapu and second kanawai, um, this one is focusing on the koa or the akoa koa, the pu koa, and talking about uh, beginnings, right? Um, from the coral polyp in, in our in our mo'olelo we are born from, it's also the thing that first grows that provides abundance in the reef system. It's the community in which, um, you know, uh, fresh water meets salt water. We have these estuaries, these muli vibes, the place where then coral does propagate and, and, and provides nutrients uh, to both people and to fish. And so the kind of that comes out of this is this idea of key OO coming together to be prepared to reach a place of healing and reconciliation to move forward as a lahui. So, so there's a literal, you know, uh, consideration of this in terms of abundance of, um, what happens mountain happens makai, but also the proverbial figurative, yeah, the kauna, if you will, that what we're trying to foster here, the, the, the plantings of the polyp, if you will, to create this particular community. And that out of this uh, kanawai, hina uh, pukuia, feeding community members with ike, with knowledge, with the assurance that this is a place of subsistence agriculture to create food security um, and, and the practice and reconnection to aina, that we stay ancestrally relevant within our own within our own homelands that we maintain kuleana. And through that practice of kuleana, we develop skills and traditions that can be passed uh, onward to future, to future generations, but also back into the aina itself. Yeah, so it's a re restoration process and a cyclic process for, for everything working together. And lastly, but not least, our, our third kapu and kanawai is uh, uh, kui kaina, keen at the birth cycles and the growth cycles of marine life along the shore break. Um, and how, you know, that then again is another reminder of me um, managing abundance for this area across generations and that sustainability, sustainability 
I, I, know, I know sometimes we'd be creative to say sustainability, I know in the middle of this, right? It has to be through practice and practice can be based upon or should be based upon the holding of traditions and knowledge that are unique to the geography, unique to the resources, unique to the conditions of rainfall and those patterns unique to the soils. And that over time, as people become ma'a to this aina, or, and, 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 and I say becoming, but there's also, yes, I wanna be sure I'm not um, um, unintentionally excluding, there are already kanaka and ohana that have connection to this place. And so um, to see how then over time um, to work together to, to basically observe, learn, and apply what needs to be applied in caring for this place. I think those were the, the three. So forthcoming work. Um, as you, as some of you know, right, we had we had started some of our archaeological work, we started some of our cultural um, interviews, and for X and Y reasons, uh, we had to take a pause. And I don't need to go back into those conversations. We, um, I think, shared last time, or, or, or I guess we're here to share tonight too. We actually found a, a group that is going to be helping us, Honua Consulting. Uh, that's going to be starting the archaeological work uh, come end of this month, so end of March. This is a very key part of the information that um, this and the water resources really are the key pieces of information that will lend us to then really apply some of the planning principles, the criteria to looking at where in on the landscape do we think we can provide lot schemes. I think I saw a question earlier, which I'm also trying to address now, you know, um, how does the identification of those resources come into play? Well, obviously, if we, we have resources that need to be cared for, both in the natural and the cultural resources, they come first. You know, the, it's paramount we care and protect these resources. And when I say care and protect, not just, you know, here's, here's the hay or here's, you know, here's the site. Are there interconnections between the site? Are there visual cues that connect us to place? Um, as a practitioner, if I'm at an advantage point, doing only down to something that's of significance, how do we create that, that understanding and, and try to map it to the best of our ability, well then whatever also meets the other criteria becomes in that opportunity. And again, it's probably easier to show this than to just speak words here. So um, without me kind of the yammering on here, because we do want to get to some other questions, is to say we, we plan to do the archeology span come in the March, that data that we gather will help to inform where um, we need to apply maybe some, some understanding of cultural resource management and, and then move forward from there. And, and with the next meeting, we will show all that data and then show where we think we can possibly do some of these subsistence ag, ag lots. Um, I have my civil engineer uh, available this evening. Um, he's literally charged with the kuleana of understanding the vai, the vai vai of the vai for this place, understanding water resource, not just from rainfall, but what's available uh, through ground, groundwater, um, uh, surface water resources, looking at what's available through the county, what, what does um, different data tell us about the aquifer and, and looking for opportunities to address uh, provision of water here for the, for the purposes of agriculture. And then last, um, we, we'll be working with um, Sustain Hawaii, uh, who will help us think through and based upon some of the comments we hear tonight as to what are those potential opportunities for community-based uses for this aina. Um, in other areas, we've looked at the uh, opportunities of well, what does reforestation involve in terms of creating quote unquote economics or industry, you know, you need, you need to have a, a few things in place. And so as we think through, or if you want a community center here, or you want um, an education center, what, whatever comes through the conversations, you know, we will have to sort of understand, okay, well, one, what's the need, um, how best to address that need and where should that need be represented, re be representative in the plan. So that's still some of the homework that, that we need to do. And I think now I'm turning it back to Barb. Mahalo. Mahalo Kavika. All right, uh, it's time for us to ask you some more questions again. So if you could go back to your um, mentee uh, screen and um, I'm moving us on to the next question, which is in three words or a simple sentence, what are some of the major concerns you have regarding this area? What are the, some of the major concerns you have regarding this area? One of the priority concerns, water. Uh, 
access to water runoffs. Safety, quality of the soil, erosion, deer, overpopulation, segregation of community, foreigners, congested roadway. Wildfire, landslide, 20 degree slope. Thank you, these are really important. Uhane. Development erosion. Okay, we've got uh, 11 people that have answered. I'm going to move on to the next one. What, phys what physical characteristics of Wallapui are most important to you? The next question will be about uh, cultural and spiritual, but this particular one is about um, what physical characteristics of Wallapui are most important to you. I would simply, oh, I'm sorry, I tried to my video off. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water to turn my camera off for a second. Um, we understand too, you know, this is the first time we've seen these questions. So again, mahalo P for providing these in the in the chat. And you know, if if you think of an answer, don't don't think this is the last time you should chime in. You know, uh, there'll be there'll be other ways to let us know via email, other ways to participate. So if you think of an answer afterwards, like, oh yeah, you know that question could be that he's talking about physical characteristics. This came to my mind. You know, my point is this is not the one and only time you have to um, share this. So if you have to miko in in the question a little bit, um, you know, no problem. Alipi will 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 work with you to to um, to gather the information when you feel it's appropriate. One answer we have so far is gulches for water and potential for use. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. And again, like Kavika said, um, we'll have other opportunities. Undeveloped nature of the area, an altered landscape, no buildings, no rubbish, open view plains, soil, hillside, road, accessibility, hazard living and environmental conditions, becoming steward of the land, maintain the beauty, the food resources and sustainability for food, food, uh, Kilohana Elementary School, definitely important. I'll wait just for a few more. Tranquility of that Ina. And I think and I think too, um, if people on the question, right, if they're still like typing stuff in, but we move on to the next question, it doesn't cut them off. Now they still can answer the question and then catch up to the next question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe that's that should uh, happen. Um, and then you can go ahead and, and select to go to the next slide. Yeah. And, and I don't mean to be the, again, the pushy one, but I think what one we're trying to respect, I think we asked for people's time till 7.30. Mm -hmm. of, of course, we can stay on. Um, I know we're like on slide 48 and we have about 12 more slides. So I think for sake of conversation, we may just want to, to, to now we aku a little bit, you know, or okay. a little bit. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. What cultural or spiritual characteristics of Wallapue are most important to you? And then we'll have uh, two more questions after this yeah, and wrap and up again, the presentation. And similarly, I'll just say like the Hali Aloha question, you know, this one, this one, we come with sensitivity, we come with humbleness to ask, um, but um, 
as shared by, by others in previous meetings, others from the community, I should say, uh, folks have been very um, giving to make us maka'ala uh, to some of the important cultural, spiritual aspects to this place. And so, again, we're not trying to be maha'oi, we're not trying to be disrespectful, just to be blatant. Oh, tell, tell, us, tell us what you know, but I think just trying to be mindful. Um, I mean, all aina can be considered to be sacred because all aina born from Pelehunua Mea to some regard or whatever tradition uh, comes from your, from your ohana and from your place. So I think whatever, again, is comfortable to share in this forum, if you feel like you can, you want to share this, but not to everybody, you can, uh, you know, maybe message to PE or email one of us later on. So, mahalo. Uh, just real quick, uh, all of them, the ED, respect for burial sites and the spirits that live there, to have the opportunity to learn love and malama pono, the aina and each other, always to respect the significant areas. The history and culture of the whole Ahuboa as Kanaka Maui, our connection is to the aina, that is where we come from. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's in response to this again, um, not to say archaeology equals culture and spiritual, but you know, the physical footprint of our kupuna as, as they exist in the archaeological resources, historic resources will give us at least a little bit of a picture. And so I'm hoping that this next meeting, we can actually share that, in, we will share that information and, and understanding. And I'm sure there, there'll be new insights about what we find um, that will further inform us. So again, this is not the last conversation uh, on this. This is very, very early on, still one of the first conversations though. Thank you. Two more questions. Um, how do you want to give back, contribute to this place and its resources? So we prompt, we're prompting this question really, um, right? You always say, well, you know, I, I, feel, I feel the words of, you know, if you live, we live, as you're speaking to the forest. So if the aina is well and good in my kai, then so are the people. The other one that comes to my mind, uh, is that it's, it is Hawaii, it is Aina's place that makes us as Hawaiian. So I think just, just in the aspect of the reciprocal nature of that connection to Aina, to, to Hakua, or to whatever your spiritual groundedness is, you know, what do you see, um, especially for those of you that are potential beneficiaries to being, to being part of this community? Um, how do you see your role in something that goes beyond just the care for your agricultural lot. How do you see yourself as part of a community? Um, see yourself as a steward of, of aina, of resources, to care for the vai, for those kinds of things. Um, again, there's no right or wrong answer, just trying to pulse um, what, by, what might be cir uh, circulating, stirring within, within the ma'au. Some answers that we have for how do you want to give back and contribute to this place and resources by community unity show that Walapue is meant to be an ag land and not residential land and by opposing this project. Okay, and I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, oops, I keep doing that. Oh, here's a few more questions. Um, much love and aloha in all aspects. We were created to Malama Pono, the Aina and Earth, each other. Uh, with, okay. Uh, do not develop this Aina, create the Ualapoi Association, restore native plants within the dwelling areas, Malama the areas to protect, to maintain, and to share and develop community garden. Having the Y feed the Kuleana through Punavai and Avai with correct Awai with correct composition of dirt to feed the water, water table as well as Kuleana. Continuing to Malama Aina from Malkwa to Makai and making sure the people who hold these leases do the same. Uh, native landscape and thriving Ahupua'a. Mahalo. Um, oh, there's another one. Uh, Aina, Kaiulu, and Lahui restoration. Mahalo, everyone. Uh, all right, and just uh, moving on then, 20 years from now, what do your keikis keiki see in Ualapue? This one, we, we pulse this question. Um, I mean, maybe it's pretty obvious, right? You know, a lot of the, the, the things we do now is Makua, 
um, the choices we make, uh, the things we literally lay down as foundation, um, the, the fruition of some of those, some of those things may not come in our lifetime. And maybe it's in our Kiki's lifetime, but then really the idea of Kiki's Kiki. I know other people talk about seven generations out in, um, and at least for me, it's sometimes hard to think about, but I, 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 I myself have a daughter who's 14, 15, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, in 10 years, she could have her own, you know, ten, uh, uh, her own child and live in her own life. And you know, what, what kind of um, space or place do I want to see for her, for my vahi? And so I think this visioning out beyond just our own selves and our own presence here, what, what does the future hold for, for this place? And how do you see those generations, maybe even those yet unborn, um, how do they connect here? And I would also, um, I'm not trying to stir any pot. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I work as a consultant on behalf of DHHNL, but I'm also charged as a Kanaka doing this work just to prompt folks. So if not this project too, you know, um, the project coming with its hopeful benefits of creating ag opportunity, abundance, uh, natural and cultural resource management, if if that's not the vision you hold, um, again, that that's no that's no um, there's no judgment on that. But you know, maybe offer up uh, what do you what you do see, and maybe how you see that coming to fruition, because that may also help our understanding. So just trying to create a, a, a space we can all share some one on dialogue. So anyway, I'll I'll shush so Barb can get to the rest. <laughs> report. I feel like I'm the, I'm the filler in between. <laughs> you're right, doing a great job. Great job. <laughs> I'll run through these real quick. Um, life on our ancestral land, a thriving farm with substantial living, a, a flourishing Aina full of sustainable agriculture feeding our people, cultivate the land, cultivates the spirit of Ohana, uh, cultivates the essence of Ao Ao, being able to live and stay on Aina as our Kapunas did, a home, Restored native landscape with no buildings, houses, encampments, vehicles. I pray they will see what my kapuna was seeing in their time, along with time some of today's mana'o. Maintaining the aina, continue the teaching reforestation, support the community within and the surroundings. Um, if you develop the aina, you always take our culture and history away. So 20 years from now, we're going to lose a part of this us as Kanaka Maoli. The ability to truly live the life as a kama aina, the kama must be on the aina and love everyone. All right, so that question will remain. If you have additional um, comments that you'd like to put on there, uh, let's move on. I just have uh, just about 10 more slides and I wanna run through these as quick as possible. It is 722, um, we wanna be aware of your time. So uh, what is in the settlement plan? So there, of course, we're doing the location and description of the tract of land, it's in Oalapue. The size and number of lots to be awarded and that's up to you. We're going to ask those questions after I um, go through this bit of slides here. Um, uh, of course, the um, smaller the lot uh, that you have for subsistence ag, the more beneficiaries can be awarded. The larger lots you have, less beneficiaries are awarded, but that's that's completely up to you of what you would like. Um, location of community center and common areas. So this is something that we haven't really discussed too much before, uh, but in, there's a community use areas besides the subsistence agricultural use. There's also community use and some of the information that we found from past plans and some uh, talking uh, with people currently is that they would like to see community use areas as a potential, you know, like a community center. Uh, it could be a place where you have um, agricultural education or cultural education. Uh, other other people have said uh, they would like to see a place as such as a um, uh, a place to uh, when you need to evacuate for a tsunami. You know, this would be um, a place that's uh, safe and everyone can gather. Uh, other people have said they would like to see, you know, a cooperative for maybe medical and mental health facilities. Uh, so please think about what are some of the things that you would like to see in a community use areas that would be beneficial to this community. Uh, also proposals for community management and economic development. So because the Kuleana Homestead uh, settlement requires that you work with each other to maintain, um, you know, specifically access the roads, it would be helpful to also have uh, income to help support these um, maintenance activities that are needed. So uh, some of the economic develop, um, development um, opportunities that have been placed in the past or, you know, some plans that we've done in uh, before include such things as an agriculture or aquacultural uh, co-op um, and this would be a place where you could bring uh, everyone brings in their small amounts of 
uh, say produce, and then this is a place where you can wash it and package it and then send it out as in bulk to uh, market. Um, see some of the other economic development things. Uh, you know, even you could um, do some planting in the mountains and use those things for, say, a, a cottage industry. Um, maybe you want to plant wake and then use it for tapa making or um, some other types of trees and uh, use them for bowl, uh, calabash bowls or for um, jewelry. Um, some other things were uh, eco uh, tours, and this could either be hiking or of nature or of cultural or even hunting tours. Um, so please think about what are some of the things that would be beneficial for, uh, you know, a group that would be specific to Walapui to help um, uh, bring up the economy for this area. Uh, and then, of course, this preservation of significant historical, archaeological, and biological sites. And then this uh, area is called a special district. So we had the subsistence agriculture use, the community use, and then a special district use. So in the past, uh, this included um, designating approximately 85 acres for the Malco portions for uh, native plants, and then also uh, an area around um, Kalao o Nakukui Heao, uh, just to preserve these areas. And, um, you know, again, these we want to respect, we don't want to, it wouldn't make any sense to um, put a subsistence ag log there. Um, and then, of course, the uh, timetable. So those are all the things that we put together in the settlement plan that at our next meeting, then you'll be able to review and comment on. Uh, from our point of view, from the planners, we're looking at, and civil engineers, we're looking at a variety of things in order to figure out what's the best thing, uh, what's, what are the best locations and best sizes in, uh, for the lots. It includes, of course, topography. We're looking at areas that have a slope of 15% or less, the proximity to roadways, um, the size of the lots, uh, proximity to water, uh, wildfire risk, um, of course, adjacency to natural or cultural resources. And then, of course, finally, it's going to, the final criteria is going to be up to the beneficiaries and what their consensus is on a lot scheme. Uh, again, we're to really fully understand what we're looking at. We um, want, we need to understand the number of allots awarded and that will affect the size of the parcels. Again, we're gonna ask you that just as I finish running through these power, uh, these slides real quick. Um, sharing the burdens of maintenance and improvements. Um, again, that would come from uh, economic development and then activities and uses adjacent to the lots and especially the activities that are on the lots themselves. So um, DHHL is requiring for Kuleana Homestead lots to be just an active use. It doesn't mean it has to have a home there. Uh, you can just have your uh, agricultural use and live somewhere else, but it does have to be an active use. Uh, and then looking at future build out needs in case there's um, things that may come in the future. So- And, and, and well, Barbara, mm -hmm. quickly add on to, and, and there may be a necessity when we look at this in full that there, um, there might be a need for phasing. Yeah? So certain activities that take place before we can do you know, the first X amount of lots and something else has to be done. So, there, so part of it is not just evaluating the lot schemes themselves, but the phasing that makes sense. That's that that hits all the concerns relative to erosion, to restoration, et cetera. So we'll be looking at that as well. That's all I want to say. Thanks. So in helping you to identify what is a, a good size lot for you, uh, here is one fifth of an acre. You know, I think it's in LA or something. It's on the mainland, definitely. Um, this is a uh, uh, 8,700 square foot lot, but they've packed it full of vegetables and produce and they are doing solar uh, on here. My, I live in Kalihi Valley and our lot is about 10,250 square feet. Um, but, uh, you know, so you probably have a live on a lot that's similar um, in size. And so think about how are you able to take care of that lot? Are you able to have the um, kind of uh, subsistence ag that you want on there, or do you need more? So then what is a, what size is an acre? And an acre is pretty much a football field where all the yard lines are excluding the touchdown areas. So don't include the touchdown areas. Next time you're at a football field, sit in the middle at the 50 yard line and kind of take a look around and that will help you to see, you know, approximately what an acre is. So that'd be five times of that previous lot. But then what can you do with an acre? Um, this particular one does have a house. Again, you don't need a house. It just needs to be uh, an active ag. This, these guys have some livestock. They have, it looks like wheat. You could grow peely grass. 
uh, vegetables, um, trees. And here's an example from uh, Kalamaula. Um, they have an uh, 1800 square foot home, vegetable gardens, they've got some chickens and rabbits, and um, uh, they even have a greenhouse. So something to think about of what you could do with an acre. A uh, two acre lot, so double that, um, good for a family of four. You could have a 2000 square foot home, it's way bigger than I have. Uh, and then of course, plenty of room for solar uh, energy, solar panels. This has more medium livestock, some goats, uh, fruit trees, vegetable garden, greenhouse. And now let's look at a five acre lot. So all of that included, this even looks like it's got a river and you know the, the reservoir. They include um, a, a dairy, beehives, um, a barn, uh, food processing area, large livestock. So this is definitely a much more involved um, subsistence agriculture lot. Yeah, and, and I think really the, the uh, visual lesson or the visual opportunity here to just understand spatially like what can fit in in any size lot, right? And so it's not the specifics of, okay, we're going to put a 2,000 square foot house. I mean, that's not what we're saying. Um, but you know, the bigger the lot, obviously you can do more and actually, and we're just trying to grab samples um, of conceptual ideas that you can do, you can do a lot with, a, with, with, well, I'll say very little, but you can do a lot with even a fifth of an acre. And as the acreage grows, you know, you actually could expand and include things in there that create a different lifestyle. That preference of, you know, so that a one that we're taking here and just trying to pulse like what's good for this community um, is something that we're going to be asking questions here. So I just want to be clear that we're not suggesting any one of these uh, conceptual plans, but these are just other examples from other places that might help to uh, might help to just, uh, stimulate your your thinking tonight. So, all right, thank you. Uh, we also want to find out from you what uh, configuration would you like. So this particular one is, you know, the typical urban one house. You take care of your own um, vegetation. This is an individual lots. Uh, if we look at shared agriculture, um, you know, the lot size has doubled. There's a one house on one end and one house on the other. But then you uh, share the agriculture. You both take care of the um, the vegetation, the crops in the middle. Um, this particular one is clustered homes with individual agriculture. So you could, you know, hang out with your neighbors at night. You can, it'd be really easy to go borrow that cup of sugar, but then you are taking care of your own um, subsistence agriculture. And then finally, clustered homes um, where everyone's together, but then everyone also takes care of agriculture together. And again, homes are not a necessity on this. This can just be um, you can also think about in your mind, if you don't want to have a home on this, uh, what kind of agriculture would you like to do? Would you like to see, you know, just your subsistence backyard agriculture? Are you thinking about maybe more of a community where a few of you get together and you all work on some crops? Or do you want something even more large scale where there's uh, greenhouses and it's a much more involved intense project or even maybe um, a traditional custom, customary uh, uh, wala, you're working together in those ways. Okay, so uh, I'm, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. So again, you know, going back to lock configuration, it has to do with lifestyle and how we try and create community. So we have these other concepts like a shared green. So whether they're a home, whether they're, a greenhouse or maybe a shared facility, how you want to work together. And I think, you know, Barry said on the individual lots, um, I think um, it's, yeah, that's more classical subdivision, uh, whether it's the ag subdivision, residential subdivision, you know, the, the benefit or, or not is the fact everyone has a clear delineation and you get to know your neighbor kind of sort of, but maybe not really working with him. The other configurations, which we actually have deployed um, on other homesteads look to create sort of more centralized space um, that allows for this sharing and working, uh, working as a community to create abundance in, in, in the food system that's going to be uh, there for to, to take care of that community. So, anyway. Okay, that actually is our last slide, but I do have some um, final questions for you. And honestly, these are really the most important ones. Um, well, they're all important, but this one will help us really specifically for the settlement plan. And so this one, we'd like you to rank uh, in order what you um, uh, feel that the Wallapui settlement should focus on. And when you type in your answer, um, it'll say first, and then you can make a selection on which one you think is first, and then it'll allow you to go to the next one and you can um, 
uh, go ahead and select the second one that's most of priority to you. So uh, these options talk about improving improved site safety and access, maximize the number of subsistence ag lots, preservation of historical and archaeological sites, reforestation and erosion management, community-based economic development, securing potable water, and secure or securing non-potable ag water. So the potable water is more for drinking water, um, and then ag, the non-potable ag water would be for crops. So just trying to look for a feel there. And um, we do have about six questions. So uh, and then we'll be um, we'll be complete with the PowerPoint. And I do apologize that we have gone over time. All right, so we're starting to get a little bit of feedback. Uh, so far, um, the, the priority is preservation of historical and archeological sites. Uh, then we have improved site safety and access. The part I usually like, because this kind of thing, it changes as people's answers come in. And, but you can see here, right? I mean, in terms of at least the first three, um, oh, we just had a shift here. Um, kind of watching the election night a little bit, um, but but it's good. You kind of see there's there's importance in the in the first two. I say even arguably the first three, and then four and five are very close. Hey, to Kalamai, I, I having a hard time of uh, trying to get the submittal mm -hmm. and trying to shrink everything that I possibly can. It goes big, large, and See, I have, oh my goodness, I'm having problems. Oh, sorry, guys. I don't know. Uh, Corey, I think this one, okay, Barb, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, does it show you uh, first and then does it have a drop down menu? I'm, I'm, yeah, but I'm looking for the submit and I'm having a hard time finding Oh, you might have to scroll down. Down. Yeah, it's further down. I'm trying to, I think I lost it. Oops. That's all right. I lost it. It got me to resubmit the whole thing again. Never mind. Okay. It's okay. I had a hard time too. I wasn't able to do it according to what my opinion was. You're not the only one, Tita. It's it's, <laughs> it's all right. I'll go. I'll go on the website. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I cannot already. All right. I got my two, two, two. We've had 11 respondents, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to the next question. Uh, is one acre the size of a football field suitable for your subsistence agriculture homestead needs? Uh, is it a good size? Is it too small or is it too large? Okay, so far it's looking like it's too small. Uh, you know, the reason why we did use one acre versus two or five is that uh, that is just something that we saw in past plans. And um, we will have one uh, question at the very end, which is an open-ended um, with additional questions and comments. If you could there, uh, it may be helpful for you to give us an idea of what size lot would be best suited for you. When it's too large. All right, we have seven respondents. If uh, there's a few others that would like to answer here, that would be helpful. Again, I know it's 740. Um, I think on the group 70 side, we, we are able to um, 
I again, appreciate everyone's indulgence. We, we can definitely stay until eight o'clock um, to finish out the slides. And I know we have some questions um, in the chat that probably Cedric will help facilitate us through. Okay. Oh, sure. You know what? I got to go on the. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, which image best represents your vision for agricultural activity at Ualapue? Uh, there's this backyard subsistence agriculture that's not a penguin, it's a chicken. <laughs> I don't know why it looks like a penguin to me. Uh, backyard subsistence <laughs> agriculture, a small community cooperative. Again, that would be you know a group of you working on a crop, a large community cooperative. This is more large and tense with greenhouses or you know that the, maybe an ag processing center or shared traditional agriculture. Um, is there something that you see, uh, you know, if you aren't necessarily looking at just your own plot, how would you like to share that with others? Or like if it. you want your own plot. No, I, I was going to simply add here, you know, because sometimes we, you know, we're asking questions are kind of in the same direction, right? You know, like, well, how big is the lot? And you know, like for people to say, we start to say, well, how much is an acre? And then sometimes even visually, like, okay, what do I think I can handle? Like, okay, maybe working more small backyard, um, you know, agricultural just to take care of my family, but oh, well, maybe I want to hoo you up with someone and do something bigger. Again, there's no right or wrong per se, it's just trying to, to um, um, kind of pulse what, what the preference might be here with this, with this group this evening. Okay, Mahalo, we have eight respondents. I'll wait for just a few more. Okay, uh, at this point, it's looking like the ranking is um, backyard subsistence agriculture followed by a large community cooperative. Uh, next question, what is your preferred settlement lot uh, sediment layout. Um, do you prefer individual lots? Would you like to share with a neighbor, share the agriculture with a neighbor? Um, do you want to have your home closer to others, however, only work on your um, own lot for your agriculture? Or um, would you like to have clustered homes and everyone works together um, on a shared agriculture? I should say too, these are not the only four. These were again the, based upon precedents working on with other, within other communities. You know, these kind of came up again. I, I think I use the term common green, which is, you know, sort of a. I'll probably say it's the it's the one version of a common kalhale. It could be like the shared agricultural version, or do you want to cluster the resources and infrastructure together, and then you malama like a certain section, or just everyone hui up and we all take care of one big area together. Now, some of this kind of creates some interesting, um, what should I say? When we could get into a lot of configuration, if it was a preference for say, at say more of the clustered homes, we would have to think more creative, creatively as to how to achieve that. But again, um, it seems here tonight, at least those participating, there's a preference to uh, maintain sort of a, your own individual kuleana, or individual lot per se. Okay, we have uh, nine answers so far, uh, eight for individual lots and one for shared agriculture. I just have uh, two more questions and then an open-ended question. Uh, what do you envision as the best use for the area designated as community use? So again, some of the past uh, plans have spoken as this area as a, um, a community center, um, a resiliency hub, that was the word I was looking for, for those places that you maybe want to evacuate and you have a safe a safe place to go to. Uh, it could also be, um, you know, maybe it's a building for uh, medical and mental health services to come in. Um, again, we're looking for any suggestions that you may feel would be best uh, suited for the community, uh, either all of those beneficiaries that are living there or would be um, helpful for the community as a whole all, uh, in Manai. Pavilion.
share of crops, safe house, Ohana. Community center, um, emergency, sheltered walkway to school, outreach medical service. I'm sorry if I did this. Okay, okay good. Uh, let's see, a certified kitchen, mercantile co-op, uh, community you pick farm. I believe there's one other one that came up. Okay, I am going to um, go ahead and move on, but we will have an opportunity at the very last uh, uh, question to add any additional comments that you have. Um, this uh, second to last one, prior plans have identified several potential income generating opportunities that may be suitable for Ualupue. Um, please rank your preferences. So uh, as we talked about before, uh, a commercial kitchen and farmer's market. Uh, so in some places, even um, they've used like a, a food truck. Um, you can have a kitchen that uh, grows stuff and then uh, that uh, processes things and then you could sell it at a food truck or a farmer's market. Um, agriculture and or aquaculture food hub or co-op. So that would be a place where uh, you would bring in your resources um, and um, aggregate them, put them together and you can wash them. You could even do canning. You can do uh, value added products um, to extend the life of those, um, the crops that come in. And again, this could be either agriculture or aquaculture um, working with those together. Uh, green energy. Um, at one point, I, I heard solar uh, panels, um, a woodworking mill. So again, this could be something where um, you've done some reforestation and then you uh, say co or, um, oh, is it Nilo? Um, those things that you could uh, use for calabash bowls um, and uh, even a koa if you want to work on a canoe, um, some things you could do with that. Um, the eco tours, again, that's, um, it, it would be, of course, up to you. I, that would be, uh, again, yes, that is uh, potentially bringing in those that are not from the area, but you could talk to them about uh, uh, the nature of the area, cultural resources, potentially hunting tours. And, um, oh, cottage industries, like a garment or craft production. Again, that was, I was thinking about um, tapa or uh, jewelry making, those kind of things, and then uh, others not listed. So if you have additional ideas, please go ahead and um, add that into our next and final uh, question. So we have four responses so far. Uh, the first one is an agriculture and our aquaculture food hub and co-op. Uh, the second is a commercial kitchen and farmer's market. And I'll wait just a few more minutes as we wrap this up. Again, thank you for your patience with us and um, sticking with us through this. Uh, again, if you had a, a hard time with this um, uh, attending live on the Mentimeter, please uh, check out the link on the uh, website, the DHHL Wallapue website. Seven. Okay, I'm just going to wait for just a few more people to log on. Okay, I'm going to call it. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, what additional questions or comments do you have for DHHL? So um, this one I would encourage you if you had a different acreage that you think would be meet your needs for subsistence ag. Um, I would ask if you could put that acreage here. Uh, also, if you had some different ideas for um, community use or uh, economic development, if you could um, list those here as well. Uh, and any other questions that you have, um, I, I know there's already some in the chat that um, Cedric can 
review. So you don't need to add these here, uh, but if there's something else that hasn't been, um, you haven't had a chance. So um, this will stay open. I'm not going to close it, but I am going to go ahead and um, Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and then just wrap this up. Um, Cedric, I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, hand it over to you again. Thank you, everyone, for your patience tonight. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, Barbara and Tobika and the, the whole G70 team. You know, we appreciate you guys working on this. And, you know, this is part of how Hawaiian homelands gets developed. You know, we don't work on these projects in a vacuum. This is a, um, it's a community effort amongst all of us to arrive at you know, what's going to be best for development of this particular project. Um, so this slide that's on the screen right now, um, I want to highlight for everyone is really important. So this email address is a way to get to us directly. So I do want to um, highlight, um, Kyo Mailani, I saw your comments in the chat with regard to the LCA and the questions regarding the cultural consultant, etc. cetera. Um, you can contact, um, we did put in G70's contact information. Pete Lani dropped that into the chat. You can reach them directly, or you can contact DHHL directly, and we'll make sure that we get you connected. Um, also, for anyone who may have not been able to get their thoughts or opinions into the Mentimeter or contributed today, email us. Gigi and Andrew and our team, we want to make sure that we get everyone's thoughts and opinions and questions um, or answers to the questions that we had tonight, we wanna get that recorded in um, as part of this consultation effort. Um, and then Gigi is responding in the chat with regard to the question on what is community use. And for this project, community use designation is an area that the Kuleana Homestead Association would manage. So it'd be up to the association, meaning the lessees of the project uh, to develop the policies and procedures, uh, who the users are, what the rent would be, fees, et cetera. Um, you know, um, examples of um, community use are uh, here, like in Kapolei, they have a uh, Kapolei Heritage Center, which is basically a hall where they have meetings, et cetera, and things like that. And that's operated by the Homestead Association. So that would be something similar, and it would be up to the lessees of the area with regard to community use. Um, actually, could I ask uh, Kavika or Barbara or Gigi, I'm not sure which one of you guys could kind of just before we close the meeting, I just want to touch on next steps for everyone. So we're, we've gathered all this information. We've got the, um, the Mentimeter information. We have the email address open. We're going we're to collect um, more information from this meeting in the community. But if someone could just touch on next steps for us before we close, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sure. And I know we, we, went, we went through a lot of stuff tonight. So thank you, everyone, for like, just being patient. So, so to answer the question directly, um, the, the two missing pieces, well, three missing pieces really um, of data is the archaeological information, which the, archaeolo the archaeological team should be back out um, at the end of March. We're hoping uh, it should probably take what take them about two weeks. Well, within a two week time frame, we should have data back. Um, we also want to conduct the um, uh, more on, uh, sorry, conduct a little bit more analysis uh, through our civil engineering department on the water resource and then also working with uh, Sustain Hawaii as our community economic resource to, to give us suggestions uh, playing off tonight's conversation. So that being said, really like the key, the, the, I guess they all work together with the information we have in hand and the intention is then we get to work on a physical layout. Um, we'll probably vet that layout obviously internally with DHHL to address any questions first and foremost come uh, come April and once we feel we're Makao Ka, we, def we, we actually wanna come back out sooner than later to, to everyone here to share that presentation of the full information of the, of the newer archeological information in a late April, I'd say latest May timeframe, but we're, we're trying to gun for end of April for that presentation to happen with the layouts. Get some feedback, there'll be some back and forth as Barb mentioned on one slide, I'm not sure, um, if we should go back to that slide, but the, the intention is to get to the point then by July, um, we're sharing this as an informational presentation to Hawaiian Homes Commission. Um, and with that sort of blessing, if you will, we would then move into the stage of um, preparing the draft EA, uh, which would take us to the end of the year. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Barb. So, so that's what's happening in the immediate, you know, next 30 days, 60 days is really trying to finish 
the archaeological work, which will then inform, and the civil engineering work, which will inform our lot schemes. We come back out to folks um, sometime in April. Uh, we'll also have a 30-day comment period, so we're not just going to be, you know, gutting this thing. We want people to participate. So in the 30-day review period, um, you know, that's that's another opportunity to provide opinion on the layout, what you like, what you don't like, other suggestions. And so again, we hope this is a really engaging process as we move forward to the next, you know, three to four months. Thank you, Kavika. And if you could just stay on this slide here, Barbara. So th this is the. Um... I want to stay on this slide just to highlight for everyone the process. So, the, you know, as how we pass through all these different steps. And I do see, uh, Keo Mailani, your comment with regard to the Molokai Island Burial Council, um, who are consultants to Shipti, have not been contacted yet. Um, Kavika, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys will be, you know, kind of going through that portion with Shipti as we move into the, the EA process? Yes, absolutely. So. Um... Once we get to EA stage, um, we will be working with Shipti, OHA, Island Barrel Council, sharing that information as part of the early consultation process in the in the environmental review period, as well as the own, as well as the separate, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, separate 6E uh, um, State Historic Preservation Review. Thank sorry, you. And, and so, oh, go sorry, ahead, Andrew. I just wanted to clarify with Kavika. The information that we will be collecting through the archaeological studies will be incorporated into the settlement plan. It will inform right. where we will um, yes. locate um, homestead lots uh, as part of the planning process. Yeah, and I do note um, uh, Kyo Mailani's further comment, uh, we should be consulting before the EA. Um, absolutely, we can, we can do an informational presentation. Um, it's always to, the, I think, the 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 request or interest of, of the respective councils. So if that's if that's something that is being requested of us as a team, I'm sure, you know, again, when we have the information to share, uh, we can work towards that goal and coordinate with you or the, or the appropriate point of contact. Okay. Um, Andrew, do you have anything else to add on here before we go ahead and wrap up? We're just about near eight o'clock. Um, no, and I don't have much to add other than to um, mahalo those on our waiting list for their patience with the department in getting to this point and for um, hanging in there with us um, as we um, try to get you to um, being becoming a lessee. So mahalo. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, just once again, thank you to everyone who's taken time out of their, you know, their evening to spend with us on this call. I know we had a lot of information here for you tonight. We asked a lot of questions. I hope that you do take the time to make sure that your thoughts, um, questions, concerns, please relay that to DHHL and the G70 team as we continue to proceed forward. Please keep an eye out in your mailboxes for the next meeting invitation. You'll get that in the form of a letter or a postcard sent to you in the mail. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Um, as mentioned earlier, the slides and the recording of this presentation and this meeting tonight will be available on the website where you found tonight's Zoom information. Um, with that said, I'd like to go ahead and close out. Thank you everyone for your time uh, this evening. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Mahalo.